everybody. This is John here. This is Paul. George. And Ringo. And we're very happy to be on your program once again. Hello and welcome to show number 76 of Beatle News Briefs. I'm your host, Steve Marinucci, and this is your home for all the Beatle news you need to know and the best talk from the Beatles world. Today we have a really big show to use at Sullivan's old trademark. First we'll have a interview with the great Peter Asher. Uh, Mr. Asher first became known to most of us as one half of Peter and Gordon. He then went on to be Apple Records' first A&R man and then became a Grammy Award-winning producer. Besides doing a ton of things these days, like working with Hans Zimmer, composer of uh, Pirates of the Caribbean fame, and and comedian Steve Martin, who's also been doing a uh, sideline as a bluegrass musician, he also uh, hosts a weekly series, Beatles Channel Show, called From Me to You, which brought about his latest project, a new book that just came out called The Beatles from A to Z. We talked to Peter, and you probably read uh, the interview I did that was on Billboard.com, but this is an extended version of that, and we'll have stuff in here that we didn't talk about in the interview. We'll also have a new segment after the interview that you want to stick around for that will include a report on Ringo's live event in Los Angeles, and some other news, too. So let's get started, and here's my interview with Peter Asher that we did on the phone. I'm talking to Peter Asher. Peter, welcome to Beatle News Briefs. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. Um, we're talking to you, to him about uh, his new book, uh, The Beatles from A to Z. Your book grew out of the your serious show, From Me to You. Is that correct? Exactly. Yeah. I'd, I'd, after I've been doing the From Me to You thing for a while, um, I had this idea of trying an alphabetical system, you know, taking a leaf out of Sesame Street's book, kind of. And and so I did it letter by letter, not just song titles, but people and instruments and ideas and time signatures and all, all kinds of different stuff using a particular letter. And and I did uh, 26 of those shows, obviously. And and it was at that, that point that I was approached by a publisher because I've, I've always been wary of book offers because I've decided long ago not to do the autobiography that that you know that I have frequently been asked to do, only because it seems like every everyone Beatle related has, has written a book mm-hmm. about that their life with the Beatles. But in this instance, I was writing obviously in the radio show. I was talking more about music and songs and 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 some stories, obviously, as they relate to all of that. And they had the idea of turning that into a book, so that's what I did. And first, of course, I thought it would be easy because oh, you just you know transcribe everything you said on the radio and look, there's a book. Not at all, of course. When you read back what you said on the radio, sort of freewheeling, it's it's not it's not uh, literate. And so I had to rewrite everything and and ended up basically writing kind of a pretty much a whole new book. Because in addition to that, you know, when you, it's a radio show. You can you talk about the music and then you play it. Right. With a book, you've got to write about it and then, you know, I would get notes from the editor, well can you explain why do you think this tune is so good and what is it about you know? So I, I had to rethink and it was it was it was actually kind of dis- difficult but but actually interesting because it forced me to think more closely about what it was about the Beatles music that made those records so exceptional. So I tried to sort of get into some of that in some depth. So anyway, I spent several months doing that and then by the by the end of which it, it uh, seemed to, to have turned itself into a book. It's, and off we go. It's funny that you mentioned about the show because reading it it's almost like you you know you're do you're listening to the show or you're you're at one of your live shows you know and the, you kept that you kept it kind of informal rather I, yeah, I wanted to keep a keep a conversational kind of informal style to it certainly mm-hmm. but at the same time it is it it's actually you know it's better written than 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 it, what you, just like what I just said you know I, I just half finished three sentences right there and I was aware of it going by and it's fine in conversation but it doesn't work on the printed page mm-hmm. and, and and another thing it's it's not just about the Beatles as a group you also talk very equally about the solo their solo music as well I do yeah I do and and also of course about what influenced them and what you know what the music what changed their music, what made their music so great, and all kinds of stuff, including, in some cases, some actual sort of musical analysis. Because it was interesting, doing the show, 
I, I would always, you know, I tell people to feel free to email me with comments and questions, and I would always worry that I was getting too kind of nerdily involved in the the in, in intricacies of time signatures or something like that. And then it turns out that when I did under the letter T an examination of all the different time signatures they used and how they'd used them, that was I got more emails saying that the people like that than, than almost anything so people actually like to get to, to take what they these days they call a deep dive you know I hate business slang but that's essentially what it is mm-hmm. let me just preface this with asking how did you and Gordon meet and decide to work together because that's an integral part of the sto- story too Indeed, yeah, well, Gordon and I met at school, you know, we just coincidentally were at the same school and in the same house at the same school. Mm -hmm. Before Harry Potter, nobody knew what I meant when I would say house, but now they do. Um, (laughs) Because, you know, those kind of English public schools, as as every Harry Potter fan knows, are divided into different houses. And we ended up in the same house, which means you're more likely to become friends. And we discovered that we both sang and, and played the guitar and loved music and had record collections and so on. And that we tried doing it together. I think I've often wondered if there'd been two more people who played guitar or played any instruments in in that particular house. Maybe we would have turned into a band, but it doesn't seem like that there were. So we we became a duo. There are so many interesting things in the book that I'm sure many people have never heard, and I'm going to jump all over and, okay. and not go in alphabetical order asking about it. But one thing that caught me right uh, caught me right away was the story that James Taylor's something in the way she moves came before George Harrison's song. Talk about that. Well, I mean, James has written that song, Something in the Way She Moves, and 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 George used that same line of lyrics, you know, um, which James took as a compliment. You know, I, I don't even know if George consciously remembered that he'd heard it in a, a, in a James Taylor song, but he had, because, you know, he'd heard the record, obviously. It was an Apple record, and George came by the studio and visited and so on. But, um, and I'm sure in retrospect, that's why his song is called Something, because it would have been quite logical to call his song Something in the way she moves. Right. But, I mean, James also pointed out that, you know, let's face it, in in, in that very same song, he used the lyrics, I feel fine, you know? Right, right. So, so you know, lyric interchange is, is quite common. But, but, yes, I think George liked that phrase, and it ended up in one of his songs. And the great thing is, of course, that both of them are totally different and extraordinarily good songs. Mm-hmm. You talk in the book about some of the movies that have been made using Beatles songs, such as Across the Universe and I Am Sam, both of which you had high praise for. What did you think of Yesterday and, and the idea that most of the movies... Oh, I liked it. Really? I, 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 I liked it. I thought it was very... I, I thought it was highly entertaining. Um, an interesting idea and an entertaining movie. Mm-hmm. And and, you're, I, and Ed Sheeran, who you, who you have t- had told me in the past that you really like, is in the movie, is an yeah. integral part of that movie. And I thought he, he was, is indeed. I, I thought he was very yeah. good in the movie. I thought he was very good. He was. No, he's great. I mean, Ed's terrific. I I was just over there in, in, in England at his big wedding bash just a, a couple of weeks ago. And, yeah, I know I, I heard Ed Sheeran on the radio. You know, he'd already obviously made a record and everything, and but uh, before he became a, a superstar and and loved the song I heard and made a point of finding out who it was and getting in touch with him and sort of saying... You know, I I like to think I know a good singer-songwriter when I hear one, and you're it. You know, and I I was very excited about him, and and we became friends. I got I got to work with him a bit and produce that uh, Elton John cover we did for a tribute album, and and so on. So yeah, I like I I like Ed Sheeran, and and I thought he was very good in the movie. I enjoyed the movie. I thought it was it was fun. Another story was the Timothy Leary connection to come together. Yeah, isn't that weird? I mean, a lot of this stuff. I found out, you know, just doing some research. It's not, you know, people go, oh, you have such an amazing memory. It's like, no, I don't. I just, I, I would just take the time to do a bit of research and look stuff up and talk to people. And yeah, I didn't realize that, that, that John had originally, uh, there was Timothy Leary who was running for California governor. And, and he wanted John to write a campaign song along the theme, I think, of Come Together. And, and that's what inspired the song or began the song, even though the song itself ended up not being suitable for a campaign song, and he never did deliver it to to Timothy Leary, but Timothy didn't apparently come back to John for a a long time, and and by the time Timothy asked for it, the song had gone in a whole other direction. Mm -hmm. And apparently John wrote him a note explaining that he was like a tailor, he'd ordered a suit and never picked it up, so John redid it to fit someone else. 
And you also mentioned how much you like uh, Aerosmith's version of the song. Um, I do, because it's, it's interesting, because usually I like cover versions that are very different. Like, I, I also mentioned one of my very favorite cover versions of a Beatles song is a fairly obscure version of Good Day Sunshine by a guy called Roy Redmond that is kind of my favorite Beatles song, Rethink. But in the case of Aerosmith, they do a pretty much the same arrangement. Mm -hmm. But... but uh, but, you know, Steve spits it out with such intensity and there's some cool uh, guitar licks and stuff that I think it's a, it's a great cover, even though it's, it's actually a, a, um, kind of a remake of the Beatles' arrangement in the, in the most general sense. But, but they, there's just enough subtle changes in it and adjustments in the whole intensity of it that, that I think it really works. Another person you mentioned in the book, and you actually give him a little more respect than I've seen other people give him, is uh, Alex Madras, Magic Alex. You talk about... I don't, I mean, yeah, I, I don't, I, I mean, I, I suppose I give him some respect, but I do talk about the fact that he was, you know, uh, mostly bogus, but, um, you know, but he did have... He, the stuff, what was interesting is the things he talked about that he was going to build or, you know, nowadays are, are very much, talk, you know, he's going to have speakers that would be uh, just kind of painted on the walls and he was going to have doors that could recognize friend from foe and tell who it was by looking at them. And and a lot of that, even though he couldn't do it, and but but he was thinking of the right lines, you know, he was really talking about facial recognition and voice recognition and stuff which didn't exist at all at that time. So he was kind of a, an interesting thinker, but yeah, he, he, he also made stuff up and, and the stuff he did build didn't work. But, <laughs> but his ideas were kind of interesting. Paul McCartney lived in your family house for a while. Yeah, um, about two years, I think. Yeah. And you got to, you got to hear uh, I Want to Hold Your Hand. Uh, you heard him yep. and John do that first. You didn't make a tape of it, did you? <laughs> No. <laughs> you see, if only I'd been able to whip my phone out and have, make a little video of it, that would be something. There we but go. That's such, te such technology. I should have asked Magic Alex to, to make me a, really? a cell phone with a camera. Really? Um, but no, unfortunately, it didn't. But you described the, the version that you heard as somewhat different than the recorded version. Is that correct? Well, it was different in the instrumentation, primarily, because they, they were both sitting at the piano. Mm -hmm. They sat side by side on the piano bench. There were no guitars. So da-da-da-da-da, and all that stuff that we think of as a, as a guitar lick began life as a piano lick. Mm -hmm. It's kind of interesting. How did Paul give you World Without Love? Um, well, I'd heard it and uh, liked it, and he had mentioned that it was an unfinished song, that he actually had sort of given up on because John didn't like it, uh, or one way or another, that the Beatles were not going to record it. I've read later, actually, I, I didn't witness this, but I, that John would even interrupt Paul when Paul would try to sort of plug the song, that after the first line, when Paul said, please lock me away, or sang it, John would go, okay, I will, the song's over. He really didn't think, he thought that opening line was kind of ridiculous. And, and so Paul had abandoned it. It had two verses, no bridge. And I just liked it. So when Gordon and I got signed up to EMI Records, which happened quite separately, I mean, we were playing in a club, and Norman Newell, a and guy for EMI, came in the club, heard us, liked our sound, took, brought us in for an audition and so on, and signed us up. Um, and when he did that, he had picked out some songs from our live show that he wanted us to record uh, in our first session. We weren't going to do a whole album. It was going to be four or five songs, five or six songs, trying to get a single. And Norman at that time was thinking that we'd probably be a bit folky. He loved our version of 500 Miles, right. that kind of thing. I think maybe we were going to be, you know, Britain's answer to the Kingston trio, the <laughs> Kingston duo, as it were. And, or, you know, Peter and Paul without Mary, that kind of thing. But meantime, he did say, do you know any other good songs worth trying? And that's when I thought back to World Without Love and thought, maybe I do. So I went back to Paul the following evening at home and asked him, you know, if, if anything had happened to the song. Did John change his mind? Did anyone else record it? No, the answer was no, nothing had happened. So I asked Paul if Gordon and I could work up a version of it. And he, he said yes. And he hadn't, we did. he hadn't 
completed the song at that point, correct? No, no. He, he, at that point, when he first um, gave me the lyrics, he also made a little demo for me, which you may have heard. Right. Because I, once I, you know, I re, I refound it on a, actually a copy I'd made on a tap, believe it or not, and and uh, and you know started playing that several years back and now of course these days when you do that you're automatically giving it to the world which is which is fine and and so he made the demo but it is only those first two verses and in time for the session i did have to nag him slightly to to uh finish the bridge eventually he went into his bedroom for an infuriatingly short like seven or eight minutes as i recall and came out with the <laughs> So I wait, and in a while, I will see my true love smile, which, of course, made the song brilliant and complete. And f to plug your live show, and you uh, are you still you're still showing the uh, the lyric sheet in, in yeah. your live show? See, absolutely, and the lyric sheet is still safe and sound. It's actually out at an exhibition now that the Grammy Museum did of of uh, lyrics and stuff. But. Um, yeah, I, it, 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 it lives, you know, it's closely guarded. It, um, it's a family heirloom. There's it. also a James Bond connection to that song, though. Uh, the the guitarist. Uh, Vic, yes, I mentioned that in the book. But, you, yeah. That Vic, Vic Flick, who's the guy who played the... In World Without Love, the, the solo, you might remember, it's the organ playing the melody mm -hmm. and the guitar doing this, this sort of noodly part around the melody. And the guitar is uh, Vic Flick. Who is also the guy who played the dum 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 lick on the Bond movies? Another, by the way, that's a bit. That's the bit of it that John Barry did not write. You know. Okay. He wrote. He scored the movies and he he wrote most stuff, but the actual little theme that lick I just sang was written by Monty somebody else. I can't remember his name, but it wasn't it wasn't John Barry though. John Barry was a genius and also of course produced produced a. Uh, our good friends Chad and Jeremy, so it all ties in together. It all it, it all does. Um, as a fan of the the TV show The Prisoner, I was astonished to read that the Patrick McGowan had actually met with the Beatles. Do you, yes. What was that? Did. What was that meeting about? Was was they looking for ideas? I for wasn't him? in the meeting. I, I wasn't included in the meeting. I think it was just them and him, uh, maybe Peter Brown or somebody or Neil. Um, but it, it just it was just the idea that they were big fans uh, we all were of the prisoner mm -hmm. and he was obviously a beatle fan and if you remember the, one of the i think the last episode right. the set we had seen where it's going to walking down the corridor with a million jukeboxes all playing all you need is love mm -hmm. and and uh so i think it was kind of the the idea uh of just let's let's see what ideas he's got you know they, and i think it was a terrific idea to think about involving him because who knows what that might have turned into? What's your favorite story in the book, if you if you care to give it away? Oh gosh, <laughs> um, well you've just you've just mentioned quite a few. <laughs> I don't really know. Uh, I mean, the oddest, I think. That, that, well, you know, the story might be the I want to hold your hand story for me because that was a significant moment. The mo the most surprising thing to me in the book, in a way, is the fact that my mother. You know, taught George Martin the oboe long before any of this ever happened. Oh my! That's just that's so much against the odds. You know, so by the time my mother met George, as you know, at that point she would have been meeting him as her daughter's boyfriend's record producer. Anyway, uh, by the time she met him in that role, it was like, oh, of course, yes, I taught in the oboe at the Guildhall School of Music. <laughs> so that's a really odd coincidence. It, it is. It is. You produced uh, Linda Ronstadt, and you in, appear in Linda Ronstadt: The Sound of My Voice, the recent documentary. Give pe people an idea of that documentary. It's wonderful. I mean, I have nothing to do with making the movie, and and I, I'm just one of many uh, people in it talking about Linda. But it's it's terrific. It totally captures Linda's genius, and not just what an amazing singer she was, but but what a remarkably intelligent and extraordinary and generous and thoughtful woman she is. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's it's, uh, it's 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 moving. It's a it's an extraordinary documentary, and it makes you cry at the end. And it's uh, a satisfying movie in every way. I mean, I've, there's a lot of good documentaries out there. I've seen, you know, Echoes of the Canyon, which I really liked, and and the Crosby one is 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 great. But I've got to say, and I'm of course I'm prejudiced because I love Linda so much, but. I, this one is the best. It's great. Talking about your solo show, Peter Asher, a musical memoir of the 60s and beyond, in which you've done variations of the tour by yourself and with 
Jeremy Clyde and also with Albert Lee. I enjoy the fact that I do various variations of of shows, and this is the one that's just like the the memoir show we call it, which is just me telling stories and singing songs. Are you going to be going out with Albert or or Jeremy or somebody or anybody else soon? Or um, I don't know how soon exactly, um, but yes, undoubtedly. You know, I enjoy both those; they're very different. The Jeremy one is obviously you know fun because I get to sing "Yesterday's Gone" and "Summer Song." You know, for the first time in my life, mm -hmm. I just sang with I sang it. I mean, I've, I've always loved those records, and of course I used to sing along with the radio. But now we get to do them together, and and you know Jeremy is an is a, an actor, and as as I was, and and so we both enjoy being on stage, and it makes it more of a conversation. So they're they're all different, and in Albert's case, of course, one has the privilege of you know playing rhythm guitar for Albert Lee, which is enough. You know, it's mm -hmm. amazing. Mm -hmm. I sit there chomp chunking my little chords, and he plays this amazing stuff. You meant, you and and of course he's got a whole bunch of stories about the Evelies and and you know stuff that and and his years with the Hot Man and all kinds of interesting stuff that I didn't really know much about everything about until I sat there listening to his stories, which are great. You mentioned you were an actor. Um, among your roles is one that I, to this day, every time I see you on there, I I I just you know it's amazing that you and Jane were both on. Your sister Jane were both on Robin Hood, mm -hmm. the old Richard Green series. Yeah, the, the, the only thing we ever did together, because I'd done, I was in Robin Hood several times on my own mm -hmm. as Prince Arthur, who, you know, King John and the Sheriff were always trying to kill or capture, but Robin mm -hmm. would rescue me to be in another episode. <laughs> but then Prince Arthur got sort of written out eventually, and then they asked me to come back with Jane, and we were a pair of peasant children whose father had been wrongly accused by the wicked sheriff. And we were trying to spring him from whatever uh, capture he was enduring, mm -hmm. and uh, and yeah, that's the only the only other thing Jane of only thing Jane and I have ever <laughs> acted in together, and it was fun. I that one you can still find, believe it or not. It yeah, still exists. Yeah, you can. You know, since the the book is about the Beatles, how would you characterize the Beatles, both separately and as a group? And separately, I'm asking for your personal. Um, you know, uh, encounters with them and your personal thoughts about them. It's a bit hard, that. You know, it's a bit like the what was Paul really like question, you know, which is a sort of, it's, it's very difficult. I mean, people are, are all so multi, multifaceted. Mm -hmm. I mean, and a lot of, uh, of course, a lot of the, of the, of, of one's perception, what a lot of the cliches about the Beatles have their origin in reality. Paul was the charmer, you know, and is, and, and John could be, Argumentative and cantankerous, but could also be spectacularly brilliant. George kind of was the quiet one in a way, but didn't mean he had, didn't have strong views because he certainly did. Mm -hmm. And Ringo is, you know, one of the most straightforward, funny, smart, entertaining people. Which because I mean, it must be tricky being in a band like that, where you could look at any one of your bandmates and go, "Boy, he's great." <laughs> you know, it could be very disconcerting. I think. I mean, I talk a lot in the book about how much I think Ringo changed the whole nature of, of drumming in popular music and, and, and why so many of his drum parts have, you know, have deservedly become you know, widely in my classics. So they're almost like written drum parts. They're, they're no longer just a guy joining in and playing the groove. It's a guy creating a part uh, that, that, that fits right in with, with the arrangement that he and his bandmates have come up with. You know, the, each of those songs, the arrangements are extraordinary in their, in their intricacy and sometimes with their simplicity sometimes in their intricacy but they always they're, they're all different you know and you, you could you could kind of say that about all of them the, their musical contributions have all been you know have all been pioneering you know to a certain yep. extent um, Paul yes. Paul's a uh, bass I was gonna I was gonna mention one one bass part and I didn't and I don't recall if you mentioned it or not in uh, getting better, when he does the slide down the bass, you know where. Oh yeah. I I that always I, I remember the first time I heard that song, I I just went wow and I you know that was just fantastic the way he the way he did that and uh, I mean he always does these kind of melodic bass lines but that is just so simple and it's. That's true. No, it's true. That is very simple. But as you say, yes, and then there's these complicated, you know, beautiful almost classical like in You Never Give Me Your Money or something you know one of those t t twisting and turning elegant 
melodic bass licks that no one else quite plays. Mm -hmm. And he plays with such fluidity and style. It's, but he, you know, he, Paul is an amazing musician. He can pick up almost any instrument and, and figure out how to make it sound good quickly. And, you know. And George with his lead guitar. I mean, uh, you yeah. could, you could, uh, you, uh, from both the the group years and the solo years, you can pull out anything there. And then John, John as a songwriter, as a you know, as a singer. Uh, I mean, he was he was just amazing. Uh, they were, and as the group, I mean, what can you say? I mean, you. Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, any one of them would have been a giant star on his own, without doubt, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so that's what's so amazing is that the four of them were a band. It is just one of those perfect storms of, of art that that happen occasionally when, you know, the right people all get together and you create something that's actually magical and better than anything that's been before or since. And we could sit here and talk all day about your career, both on record and as a producer, how do you look at it? how do you look at the whole thing from your viewpoint as you know from all all these years? Oh, I guess so far so good. You know, uh, would be the overall flavor of it. I, um, you know, I'm very happy with all the stuff I've been lucky enough to do so far. I'm extremely fortunate. I'm still working. Uh, you know, I still get offered work and love doing it. I work with Hans Zimmer on movie stuff. I. You know, I was in the studio not long ago back with Steve Martin and the Steep Canyon Rangers doing some more bluegrass stuff with them. Um, you know, there's a number of other projects brewing and, of course, this, this whole book business and a bunch of gigs. So, so yes, I find myself busier than ever and, and enjoying it a lot. And, and I'm, you know, I, I, I seem to have a lot of energy in the sense that I've never... You know, I, I, I don't find any of it daunting in the sense of getting tired or 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 any of that or finding it repetitive. I mean, every time I embark on making a record, I'm as excited the night before the first day in, in the studio as I as I ever was. Are you going to do a book tour? Yes, it's in November. I know I'm doing some stuff in New York. I know I've got a book soup in L.A. I know they want me to do and. I think there's some some television and radio and a lot of radio and all kinds of stuff being organized. But but I shall go where I'm told and and talk about myself till till everyone's bored with it. The last couple of weeks I've been working on the audio version of the book, which is which is when you think about it, it's kind of bizarre because this thing began life as a radio show. Um, you know, then I took everything that I rambled on about and turned it and wrote it all down and sent it to a book, and now I've got to read the damn book. You know? <laughs> so I've just I've just got that finished. It's like ten or eleven hours of of reading stuff that that you know I wrote because because they wanted me obviously you know they they sometimes use actors and stuff rather than the author. Mm -hmm. But in, given the fact that that I'd spoken it in the first place, they said, well, of course you'll do the audio book, and I went, oh, fine, you know, not realizing. It's like, you know, if you think about it, reading a whole 300-page book into a microphone without being boring or bored mm -hmm. <laughs> is quite laborious. So I've been doing that lately. Thank you for taking the time for uh, to talk to me, and best of luck with the book. Uh, and buy this book, folks. It's, fa it's, it's, really, it's really good. It's really good. I much appreciate that. That's really nice of you to plug it. Thank you, Peter, and uh, you take care. Thank you very much, Steve. Much appreciated. All righty. Thanks again to Peter Escher for the interview that he did for us. You can hear his serious show from me to you weekly at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time Thursdays with repeats at 5 p.m. Eastern on Saturday, 8 a.m. Eastern on Sunday, and 1 p.m. Eastern on Tuesdays. And don't miss a so solo show that he does in several variations, either by himself with Jeremy Clyde of Chad and Jeremy and with Albert Lee, uh, guitarist Albert Lee. You can find the schedule at his website, www.peterashermusic.com. And we'll be right back with the news, so don't go away. And now here's some news. Ringo Starr did a live interview last night at the Saban Theater in Los Angeles to promote his new book, Another Day in the Life, that recently was put out by Genesis Publications. He was joined by two of his longtime friends, filmmaker David Lynch and legendary photographer Henry Diltz. Uh, he was interviewed by Brad Talinsky of Parade. Ringo was very relaxed and talked about a number of different subjects. Uh, he talked about uh, all sorts of things. Um, 
two of the things he talked about, uh, he talked about drum, what it was like drumming for John, Paul, and George in the Beatles. They did write some incredible songs, great melodies, uh, you know, and it, in three different styles. You know, I mean, at the beginning it was uh, John and Paul, you know, they wrote everything, and then they started writing separately. And, yeah, I mean, uh, the, the other thing we did when the, somebody had the song, the other three would give their all. That never stopped. Every time there was a counting, we all gave our all. And I think it still shows today. I mean, they're still playing our records today. Yeah. No. No, yeah. You know? And on your way out, uh, you could buy the Abbey Road. It just came out. <laughs> And there's been talk on the internet constantly about how great Ringo's voice sounds these days. And he talked about that. It's uh, like everything else. The more you use it, the better it gets. Yeah. And, you know, I'm doing two tours a year, I'm making a record, I'm singing in pubs. But <laughs> 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 um, yeah, you know, we have to find the key uh, that really suits me. And when we're doing my record, that's what we do. We find a good key for me. And uh, I do my best. Ringo's entire interview, which lasted roughly an hour, is on YouTube. And Mike Narr, a member of our Beatles News and Information group, and see what you're missing if you're not a member, posted this note to our group and a couple of others this past week. And I thought it was so interesting, I thought I'd read it. It says, This past Saturday I attended a flea market in New Jersey. I ended up spending a while flipping through a box of old rock magazines. I picked out a few, as I often do at these events, such as an old circus, a crawdaddy with George Harrison on the cover from 77, and a couple of others. Much to my del delight and surprise, I see a 1975 Beetlefest program in a bag for $5. Well, of course I'm going to get that. My first fest was 1982, so I wanted to see the format of events and who the guests were from a fest seven years before I started going. Much to my surprise and delight and utter shock, I never expected to find what I found when I got home. When I opened it up hours later at home, I looked at the special guest page, and there he is, Mal Evans listed as a guest, which already is awesome. But it's autographed. It looks like it's signed in ballpoint pen by Mal Evans. I have no doubt this is real. I've been collecting and following the Beatles since the late 70s. I've attended the fest for over 37 years in New Jersey and New York, a few times in the eight, early 80s, and I've never seen a Mal Evans autograph. Um, it, it, my comment about this is it very likely is real because the guests do autograph the programs. I mean, when I was a before I long before I started doing anything Beatle wise, I used to go to the fests in Los Angeles and I would have the guests autograph my book. So it's very possible that that's a real autograph. Congratulations, Mike. By the way, that that was the second year, 75 was, of the Fest for Beatle fans. So, very cool. Guitarist Lawrence Juber announced a series of upcoming dates um, within the next month. He'll be in California, New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. For more info, info and for the exact dates, see his website, www.lawrencejuber.com. Thanks once again to our very special guest, Peter Asher. That's all for today. Thank you for coming and listening and being a part of the show. And remember, you can find our shows on fab4radio.com, Beatlesarama, iTunes, Google Play, YouTube, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or wherever you get your podcasts. Look for our Beatles News and Information page on Facebook and join us. And also check out our That's What I Want Beatles Store page on Facebook for great deals for yourself or your favorite Beatle fans and links to my ebook, Meet a Monkey, Davy Jones, and contributing editor Candy Leonard's Beatleness. And if you like the show, please subscribe. <laughs> we'll be looking for you next time. Till next time, this is Steve Marinucci saying... Be seeing you.
keep that one. Mark it fab.